Our week at the 2018 Shooting Hunting and Outdoor Trade Show, this week on Mail Call Mondays. Mail Call Mondays is brought to you by Modular Driven Technologies. If you need a chassis system for your precision rifle, check out mdttac.com. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this week we are going to talk about what we did last week, which was attend the 2018 Shooting, Hunting, and Outdoor Trade Show in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, now, I have a ton of stuff to go over here. I am battling a sinus infection, so uh, my voice is probably sounding a little bit weird, so may have to take some drinks from time to time, but we have a lot of stuff to go through here. Uh, so let's start out with the top. First of all, uh, I'm going to go through precision rifle stuff, I'm going to go through optics, and then just some general other stuff uh, that I noticed at the show. Uh, first of all, uh, we started the week off with the Industry Day at the Range, uh, which is held at the Boulder Rifle and Pistol Club, and it is uh, obviously just outside of Boulder, Nevada, uh, so outside of uh, the Las Vegas area, but it is a really great facility, and we appreciate the fact that uh, we have an ability to go out and shoot some of these longer range items. Uh, the first thing that we did was roll up to the Ashbury Precision Ordnance booth, or their table set up there on the long range side of the range, and we were able to get a chance to shoot their new Supra 224 Valkyrie rifle, and we were shooting it out to 900 plus yards. And uh, this is actually Jim Gilliland's personal rifle. Uh, to w the way I understand it is Jim didn't even get to shoot it yet. Um, it was finished up, brought out to SHOT Show, and uh, everyone else got to shoot it before Jim actually got to shoot it. I'm happy to report that Jim actually did end up getting his rifle, um, but it had quite a few rounds down the barrel before he got it, so uh, I'm sure Ashbury will probably have to uh, rebarrel that thing. Uh, but it's interesting because as we go forward, I want to check back with them and find out what kind of barrel life they were getting uh, out of that rifle, because that's really one of the big questions about 224 Valkyrie. Uh, it hasn't been out there long enough. We don't know what kind of barrel life we're actually looking at it. Uh, so we're waiting for some uh, real-world results uh, to see where that cartridge is going to stack up. Um, Federal did provide the ammunition for it, uh, so we were shooting Federal Gold Medal Match through it. Um, it worked very well. I had no problem hitting steel at uh, 900 yards, but one thing that I did notice uh, with that rifle and with that cartridge is uh, whereas with a 6.5 Creedmoor, uh, I could see my impact on the, uh, I think it was 996 yards or 960 yards, something like that, but it was a 900-yard plate, uh, less than a thousand yards, but usually with 6.5 Creedmoor, 308, etc., I can see splash on that plate. Uh, with the 224 Valkyrie, I could not see my impacts on the plate. Uh, if I missed, I could see a puff in the dust, uh, but I couldn't actually see the impacts on the plate. So uh, I went through quite a few shots and I wasn't sure if I was hitting or not. We had a little bit of wind, uh, but not enough that I needed to hold off the plate. So, um, just something to keep in mind with that cartridge, and that is a limitation of the bullet that you're launching. Uh, so the rifle worked just fine. Uh, APO, the it was in their own chassis, and they are working on magazines for that rifle. So magazines specifically for 224 Valkyrie, um, and they're still testing and tuning those magazines to to get the feed just perfect on them. Uh, no questions on or no uh, answers on availability on those magazines just yet. Um, next, we went over and we ventured across uh, Ruger's table, and they had the new Precision Rimfire out there. And I tell you what, it was absolutely hilarious to me because it was a very popular uh, area, so I had to wait a little bit to get up there. And there was an older gentleman in front of me. Uh, I don't know if he was a buyer or media or what he was, but uh, he asked to shoot it, and they brought it out, and they had suppressors on all of them, and they had... Uh, uh, targets set out downrange. I think I believe there were 50-yard targets. Uh, and he got down behind this rifle and pulled the trigger. And of course, you get a click and really not much else. And then you hear the ping of the bullet hitting the target downrange. And the first shot, he started to giggle. Um, and this has been my uh, kind of my experience every time I get somebody down behind one of these rifles. Uh, they start giggling because uh, it's just so much fun to shoot a suppressed 22. Uh, now, 
And that's any suppressed 22. Uh, but the Ruger Precision Rimfire did have some advantages to it. It has a fully adjustable buttstock, so length of pull and comb height. Uh, they did integrate the length of pull and the comb height into one throw lever, so one throw lever does it all. Uh, now, one sad thing that I did see is that the lower half and that whole back half of the rifle, the whole buttstock, uh, is a composite material. Uh, so it it is plastic. Uh, it's not something that you're going to be able to swap out without uh, irreversible possibly altering the rifle itself. Uh, now maybe at some point down the road somebody will come out with a new uh, lower position because the upper receiver is the serialized part. Uh, so maybe somebody will come out with a new lower piece. Maybe somebody will come out with some kind of adapter uh, where you cut the old stock off, screw an adapter on, and then you have uh, other buttstock choices. But I think they really uh, dropped the ball on the buttstock. I would have liked to have seen the rifle come in even at a $100 higher price point uh, if that buttstock was replaceable and uh, had the ability to take AR type buttstocks to open up that whole aftermarket. Uh, so the rifle shot great. Um, it is, uh, the, the trigger in it was just fine. You'll see new triggers coming out later on. There is no, uh, the Ruger Precision Rifle triggers will not fit in the Ruger Precision Rimfire at this time. Uh, but I got word that other companies are currently working on triggers for that rifle. Now, one really cool thing about it, actually two really cool things about it, is it takes 1022 magazines. Uh, so if you have a mess of 1022 magazines like we do, uh, they slot in the mag well real easy. Um, the other really interesting thing is it is a dual bolt throw. Uh, you can adjust the bolt throw from the really short rimfire bolt throw, uh, or you can remove a clip and go to a full center fire length bolt throw uh, to more closely duplicate that of the Ruger Precision Rifle. And that was Ruger's whole goal with this rifle is this is intended to be a training rifle to duplicate the feel of the Ruger Precision Rifle. And in that aspect, they did exactly what they set out to do. Uh, the rifle feels like a Ruger Precision Rifle. But in the same vein, that is one of its weaknesses because most people I know have swapped out the buttstock on the Ruger Precision Rifle uh, for something that suits their intended purpose a little bit better, and you won't be able to do that on the Rimfire. Uh, nice price point, however, the price point is still above that base class cutoff for uh, National Rifle League 22 competition. So this will be an open class rifle, uh, not that big of a deal. Uh, the barrel, we did find out that the barrel utilizes an AR type um, barrel nut. Uh, not necessarily an AR barrel nut, but that type of system for the handguard and the barrel nut. So that, again, opens up the aftermarket uh, for plenty of forend options and hopefully plenty of barrel options. But you are not stuck uh, just with the barrel that comes with it. Uh, we weren't able to do any accuracy testing, but I had no problems uh, popping the little hostage plate on the uh, um, target's uh, hostage flipper. Um, at about 50 yards, which really is not still not going to be accurate enough for NRL competition. I would like to get this rifle in a controlled setting and put some uh, match ammunition through it and see how accurate it's really going to be. Uh, but I told Sarah as we walked away from that booth, uh, I'm more than likely I'm going to go ahead and purchase a Ruger Precision Rimfire later this year just for my own work. And because even if the rifle right out of the box uh, does not perform to my desired uh, level, I'm sure that the aftermarket is probably going to pick that guy up and there are probably going to be lots of barrel and handguard and trigger options available uh, down the road. Uh, next, we went over to the Legacy Sports area, and Legacy Sports had uh, quite a few interesting rifles, but the ones that really piqued our interest, first of all, was the Lithgow LA-105 uh, and 6.5 Creedmoor, uh, and this rifle is brand new. Uh, Legacy was telling me that the example that they had there was actually the only one in the country right now, and this is a really beefy rifle that should be a great uh, competition rifle right out of the box. Uh, they had it set in a KRG Bravo chassis, uh, which again really is the only setup currently uh, available. And the Lithgow really ticks all the boxes. It has a great trigger, has a three position safety so that you can lock it with a round in the chamber. You can lock it and be able to unload it. And of course, uh, your third position is fire. Uh, it has a very short bolt lift. It has a three lug bolt and it has one of the beefiest bolt bodies I think I have seen on a short action type rifle. Uh, they had it set up to feed from uh, AI style magazines through the KRG chassis. 
um, and it worked uh, just fine overall. It was a really a ton of fun to shoot. Uh, and I'm looking forward to this rifle being available for competition shooters. They're shooting for that $2,000 price point. Uh, and for $2,000, that really is uh, a great overall rifle. Now, again, uh, we didn't get a chance to shoot it for accuracy. All we're doing out here is uh, banging steel and uh, busting clays out on berms. Uh, but the rifle felt great overall. And I'm really looking forward to actually being able to get hands-on and do a full review on that rifle later on. I'm sure a lot of our uh, Australian viewers are really excited about this. Lithgow is an Australian company and uh, it's a really great looking overall product and great feeling overall product. Um, Matt really wouldn't let me leave the Howa booth until I got some time on their mini chassis rifle and that is chambered in 6.5 Grendel uh, and that is a really cool really fun little rifle so if you have a little shooter at home or you just want something to go out and uh, shoot pigs with or varmint hunt with uh, that little 6.5 Grendel rifle is a ton of fun and they really are not that expensive. Uh, next, we ventured down to Geisley, and uh, Geisley Automatics had a brand new trigger on display. It's their Super 700 trigger, and this one is really interesting because uh, it is both a uh, two-stage and a single-stage trigger, depending upon how you set the trigger up. Uh, it had a very clean break. It felt very good overall. Uh, they didn't have much more information on it because it is still a product in development. They said it won't be April or won't be available until an April release. Uh, but you're looking about $250. Uh, now the triggers that they had out there did have a curved trigger bow, and they have no information on if they are going to make a straight trigger available later on. Uh, but the curved bow did did feel really nice. Uh, the trigger worked fine overall. And uh, as you know, Geisley does not put out a product unless it is extremely high quality. So uh, we're looking forward to seeing how that works out when it is released in April. Uh, we talked to Huber Triggers while we are out at the show, and Huber has a couple of projects that are uh, in the works, and one of which is an Accuracy International Trigger. Uh, this, I'm really curious to see uh, how this is going to work out for them because uh, Accuracy International factory triggers are very high quality triggers and very reliable triggers. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure where the market push to replace this trigger is, uh, but I'm sure there will be people out there that will purchase them. Uh, Huber was trying to get it ready for the show. It was not available for the show, so they are looking at about 30 days from the show, uh, they claim, at their release date. Uh, and we're looking at about a $300 price point for that Huber trigger. So uh, as soon as they are available, we will try to get one in and see what kind of benefit this gives us over the Factory Accuracy International trigger. Now back on the show floor, B&T Industries, uh, makers of the awesome Atlas Bipod, had a brand new version out. This one is called the Cal, uh, and it is very similar to other Atlas Bipods, but it addressed one of the key... Uh, arguments about the Atlas bipod and that is the pan feature on the Atlas bipod really doesn't have any way to completely lock it out. Uh, if you tighten down the tension wheel that is in the axis of the bipod uh, then you really can't lock that out because the leverage of the legs will overcome the leverage that you can apply with your hand to the lock. Um, so people kept requesting a non pan bipod and so what BNT has released is the cal and the cal stands for can't and lock uh, so the bipod does have a can't ability so you can get that can't dialed out uh, but then you can lock that down and you have no pan ability at all in the bipod uh, they utilized a kmw pod lock uh, to be able to lock that out and of course you can clock that pod lock to wherever you want it to uh, it comes straight out of the back of the bipod like you would find on a regular harris bipod and you can can't that and get it out of the way if you need to. Um, the legs utilize the same push button uh, 45 degree cant design that you see on other Atlas bipods, although it does appear uh, that the axis is a little bit wider apart. That center section is a little bit wider to put those bipod legs a little bit wider out. Uh, and we'll compare it to an actual uh, regular Atlas PSR bipod when we get one in. Um, we actually spoke with BT Industries yesterday and we're on the list to receive one as soon as they're available. Uh, so we'll get it in and we'll show you guys how well that works. It does utilize the same kind of leg design 
design as the PSR bipods. Uh, so the legs do not rotate. They have a groove that they will track straight. And what this should do combined uh, with the no longer having the panning design is it should still allow you to load the bipod uh, very well, um, but not have to worry about those legs walking on you and getting out of alignment. Uh, I actually prefer the PSR bipod. I will be curious to see if I prefer the cowl over the PSR, uh, but that's going to take some range time to see if I like that. One really cool design that they did include in the cowl bipod is on the front of it, it will actually come with another rubber foot screwed into the front of the bipod. Uh, now, that foot is there to provide you a little bit of cushion if you run that against a barricade or against any kind of uh, hard item. Uh, it gives you a little bit of traction, so hopefully the rifle will slide around. And the really cool part is, if you want, you can unscrew that and you can attach spikes or any other uh, attachment you wish uh, to the front and now you can dig in to those uh, wooden barricades if you wish. So uh, kind of just a value added thing. That area wasn't really used previously. And so now it's there and now you have the ability to uh, add an extra attachment if you wish. So um, again, really neat overall, really high quality. Uh, and I love that B&T is really listening to their customers and trying to advance their product. We also got a chance to check out Ultimatum Precision while we were at the SHOT Show. And unfortunately for Ultimatum Precision, because of the government shutdown, they weren't actually able to get any of their actions uh, or their uh, display rifles into the country. So as you went up to Ultimatum Precision's booth, uh, they had a great big 3D printed model of their action on a display rotating above. So you actually got an idea of what the action looks like, but unfortunately there were none on hand. Uh, now, when I talked to the guys. Um, thankfully, uh, we have one ready to go back here. Uh, as soon as I return home from the SHOT Show, I called my FFL and uh, my Ultimatum Precision deadline action was actually sitting here. Uh, so now I've got it in my hands to show you guys what we're talking about. Uh, now the action overall, the short action version, comes in at $1,200. And again, it really has a lot of great options uh, on this action. Uh, you have a 60 degree bolt throw. And unlike the U300, they really, really lightened up this bolt throw or bolt lift uh, is very nice. It's very easy to blade it with my hand uh, and unlock the bolt. Um, it does have a three lug uh, 60 degree bolt throw and the bolt head is removable and replaceable. We do have a standard 308 bolt face on here as well, but in the box they sent us, uh, we received a uh, 223 bolt face and a magnum bolt face as well. So now that leaves us with way too many options to decide what caliber we are going to build this action into. Uh, if you guys have some recommendations on what caliber we should build at, please go ahead and leave it in the comment sections down below. I'd love to hear uh, what you think we should build, but not just what, uh, but why you think we should build into that caliber. Now, uh, a couple of things about the action. Uh, you saw we have that easily removable bolt head. There's just a cross pin in there. So you can take the firing pin assembly out by hand, uh, knock that cross pin out, and then uh, pull the bolt face off and swap it out really quickly. Uh, it does have an integral bolt lug in here, so you do have the ability to run a uh, switch barrel type system, and you can go from 223 to 308 or 65 Creed more or uh, 65 Psalm or any of those other cartridges that you want uh, just by popping that bolt face off and removing the barrel. Now, the action for that $1,200 price point does only come with one bolt face option, uh, but you can choose other ones if you wish for a uh, nominal cost on their website. Uh, these guys are available and they are uh, shipping right now. Uh, the short action is the only one that is available at this time, uh, but uh, they do have the um, long action, which should be available mid-February, and that'll be about that $1,400 price point. None of these prices are solid. They are subject to change, uh, but $1,400 is about where we're at on that. Um, the long action... Although it will have a magnum bolt face, it will not accommodate the uh, 338 or 300 Norma or any of that stuff. Um, they may end up putting out a larger magnum deadline action uh, to be able to accommodate those cartridges, but we have no real solid information on that at this time. Another interesting uh, company that was on display in the uh, upper level of the SHOT Show was Wolf Precision. Uh, and we actually had a couple of shooters stop by and tell us, hey, you got to go check this out. They have this really cool system. And uh, 
What Wolf Precision did is they addressed the rebarreling of rifles in a very novel way. Uh, now, when you rebarrel a rifle, there's really what you could probably describe as two different sections to that barrel. There is your chamber section, and then there is your lead and rifled section. And what Wolf Precision did is they essentially separated these two sections into two different machined parts. Uh, so when they go to machine a barrel onto the action, uh, they will machine a chamber section that is chambered for your cartridge, and then it is threaded on the end. So that would thread into the action, and then you have a barrel section that contains the lead and the rifling that would then screw into the chamber cylinder. Um, what this does overall is when you wear a barrel out, you don't wear the chamber of the barrel out, you wear the lead, the throat, that part that transitions from the case into the rifling, uh, and of course the rifling beyond that. Uh, so what they did is they made the ability to retain that machine part and then just unscrew and replace uh, the barrel with the lead in it. And their claim to this is, first of all, there's less cost because there's less machine time involved. All your head space uh, is contained within that chamber area. Uh, and it allows them to give you a replacement barrel uh, ready to go for $545. Uh, now, that's including the blank, which is a, a pretty decent savings for what your average rebarrel job is going to be. Now, the unfortunate thing is this is only available at this time on bat rifled actions. Uh, and the whole bat rifled action or barreled action uh, is going to set you back $2,195. Now, once you have that initial cost covered, uh, when you go to order a replacement barrel, uh, that's when that $545 charge will come in. Uh, but what they still want you to do is they want you to order the barrel from them. They'll spin it up and have it ready. Uh, then you can send your rifle in. They will replace the barrel and send it back, and it shortens the overall turnaround time. Uh, that is the claimed advantage to it. Uh, now, the accuracy, they're still claiming excellent accuracy out of it, uh, but uh, we'll have to tell as time goes on. They did offer to send us out a t &E rifle to test it out for ourselves, uh, so I will be really interested to see how this goes down. Uh, one of the other claimed advantages that they said is for uh, law enforcement agencies or the uh, smaller gunsmith, uh, they are willing to provide training on how to replace these barrels, uh, so especially for law enforcement agencies. Uh, if they need to replace the barrel, they can order a replacement barrel from Wolf Precision, get that barrel in, swap it out at the armorer's bench, and get that gun back up and running in a matter of hours instead of having it down uh, for weeks off at a gunsmith to be rebarreled. Uh, so really interesting. Again, not available for any other actions at this time, only the bat actions, uh, but we will see as they go forward if they decide to expand that onto other actions. We also cruised by Seekins Precision and checked out a couple of their new products. Uh, Seekins did a pretty massive product dump the week before SHOT Show. Uh, every day they were pretty much uh, releasing a press release on a new product, uh, but a couple of those products really caught our attention. Uh, first of all, uh, their Tactical Havoc Bottom Metal uh, was really interesting. This is an M5 inlet. Uh, it is designed for competition shooters, so it has an integrated barricade stop in it, but it also has a really interesting magazine release. Uh, they basically machined out the front of the trigger guard and placed the magazine release button in the front of the trigger guard, and it is a push forward to release the magazine. So it's very different to, difficult to ram this against something and uh, release your magazine. Uh, and since it is low profile and since it is in the trigger guard, it's very difficult to accidentally release it with your trigger finger. And it does take quite a bit of pressure with that forward trigger finger uh, to hit the lever to drop the magazine. So I seriously doubt uh, recoil is going to be an issue in releasing the magazine. And I don't think you're going to brush it with a gloved finger and accidentally release it. Uh, hopefully we will be able to get one of those in soon. Uh, we've got a couple of projects that do require M5 bottom metal, and I'm looking forward to getting that in, putting it in. Uh, the fit and finish is absolutely spectacular on the display model, like all Seekins products that we've come across, uh, but it looks like it really ticks all the boxes, and because it is a standard M5 inlet, uh, we're seeing more manufacturers offer rifle stocks already pre-cut for that M5, so when you get it in, you can drop that bottom metal right in, and you don't have to worry about grinding away with a Dremel to open up your stock, or the added expense of sending it off to a gunsmith to have it inleted for that bottom metal. Uh, 
Uh, next, Sequence Precision had their ProComp 10X stocks, and these are a molded stock, uh, which seems to be a new thing for Sequence Precision, getting into the uh, molding of plastic. And uh, this is for an AR-15 or AR-10 type platform, so small and large frame ARs, and it does have an adjustable cheek piece, and the really interesting feature on it is, it is a fixed butt stock, uh, but the cheek piece is fully adjustable, and it has a push button adjustment. Uh, so you loosen up the push button lock, you can push the button, it has several detented positions to get that cheek piece where you want, and then you can take an Allen key and you can lock the button back down uh, so that it doesn't move anymore. Uh, so it should allow you to get that initial setup done rather quickly and then lock it down and not have to worry about it again. Uh, it, is, it does appear to be a rather lighter weight piece, and I apologize, I don't actually have the weight written down on my cheat sheet here, uh, but it does look to be a really good option uh, going forward. The last piece that they had that uh, really interested me was the uh, Select Adjust Gas Block. Now, adjustable gas blocks are nothing new. They've been available for ARs for quite some time, uh, but this one is a little bit different. It combines a, a fully adjustable gas block and a switch block kind of into one setup. Uh, so what it will allow you to do is use the set screw adjustment to dial that gas in uh, for your rifle, and then once you get it dialed in, you now have the ability to just flip the switch back and forth between suppressed and unsuppressed settings. Uh, so those you that may have one situation where you want to run with a suppressor and one situation where you don't, uh, this is a really great option. Otherwise, you have to either set it for unsuppressed and suffer with the rifle being overgassed in the suppressed area, or you end up setting it for the suppressor and the rifle won't run without the suppressor. Uh, so being able to just quickly switch between those two is great. And in the past, you had to kind of suffer with whatever a manufacturer decided your port size needed to be for suppressed or unsuppressed on a switch block. Uh, this way you can decide exactly how much gas you want running through there and then be able to significantly cut that down or open that up to run suppressed or unsuppressed from there. Uh, so really a neat overall product. Um, the bottom metal, uh, they're advertising at $179. The Pro Comp stock is $195. And the Select Adjust Gas Block, they're advertising at $119. Uh, Next on the list was Magneto Speed, and Magneto Speed always has some cool stuff uh, on display. Of course, they had their uh, T1000 target indicators. They have another new target indicator that we're not ready to quite um, bring up to you, but it was on display in the booth. And then they had their new U-Pod. Now, we talked about the Magneto Speed grip system and the replaceable grip cores, uh, but they were running into some people that had bought an AR and were hesitant to go ahead and replace the grip that they currently have on that AR. Uh, well, the U-Pod solves that because you don't have to replace the grip. Uh, they were demoing it on an A2 standard grip, and it is a monopod module that just simply uh, sticks into the bottom of the A2 grip and holds itself in uh, by a friction arm uh, inside the monopod. And then you have a quick deployable and adjustable monopod in your standard grip. Uh, now, it does come available with a variety of other tension arms, uh, so you do have the ability to use it on a wide variety of grips. Now, I can't say all grips because, of course, then there will be some oddball grip out there that, that does not work with, but if you have a large cavity in the bottom of your grip, uh, like the Magpul Miad, some of the Mo grips, the A2s, etc., uh, then the U-Pod should fit. Uh, it is an $80 price point, which some people may think is on the uh, upper end, but if you need a monopod type setup. Uh, it really is a high quality piece and it seemed to work well uh, while we were working with it in the booth. And it is the same type of setup uh, as on the grip system. And we have used the monopod on the grip system and it worked very well overall. Uh, we went by Accuracy International's booth mainly because uh, as we were walking by, they had the new AX50 multi-caliber on display and they had it hanging from a really right stuff tripod. And when I say hanging, I mean hanging. Uh, normally you try to get a rifle, especially one as heavy as an AX50, centered over the center of gravity of the rifle, over top the center of gravity of the tripod or the apex of the tripod. In this case, uh, because the AX50 utilizes a different um, hand stop or hand grip portion, uh, the regular really right stuff AX 
piece would not fit on it. So instead, uh, they had it clamped to a forward Picatinny rail and really the majority of the weight of the rifle was hanging out beyond the tripod. And it not only was the ball head holding that steady, uh, it was fully stable on the tripod. So I was absolutely amazed at that. But while we were in the AI booth, um, we talked to them about some of the new things that they have available for 2018. And the main thing is uh, the AX multi-caliber and the AX308 is now available in left-handed configurations. So you guys that uh, need a lefty rifle, uh, those are available now. Uh, the AX50 multi-caliber is still uh, being developed, so it isn't ready. It doesn't have a release date, uh, but they have done a lot of work to update that guy from the previous AX50, um, and it now has uh, the ability to swap barrels. It has. Uh, it, they're working on a dual-stack 10 round magazine for it. Um, just a lot of nice improvements on it. So hopefully uh, when it gets ready to roll, uh, we'll be able to actually shoot that guy and come back and give you a full report on the uh, AX-50 multi-caliber. And I'm sure it will be a ton of fun to shoot. We went by uh, KRG's booth, and KRG had a couple of things on display. Uh, first of all, the Bravo is now going to be available in colors. There's a green and a brown colorway available. Um, they also are uh, getting ready to drop the Howa Bravo. Um, they're also working on a Bravo for the Lithgow rifles. So those of you guys that are in Australia right now and have access to Lithgows, uh, then that is something that KRG is working on. Also, when we start to get them into the States, uh, it looks like that will be a uh, pairing uh, with Legacy Sports to be able to have the U.S. Lithgow LA-105s uh, equipped with the Bravo chassis system. So uh, that is a really great thing to see. Uh, they also had on display the new enclosed forend. Uh, for those of you guys that don't really want to mess with a night vision bridge or anything, but you want something covering the top of your barrel on your KRG chassis, uh, you can go ahead and purchase the enclosed forend. And that is a $270 option. Uh, but what that will do is that will protect the top of the barrel forward. And if you're like me, and I tend to like to sneak my thumb up over the top of the barrel, uh, that will give you a little bit of added protection. It also, of course, allows you to put on uh, laser designators or laser range finders or clip on night vision devices and all that fun stuff. Uh, so that is now an option. Uh, KRG also had the Fox 42 on display. And of course, they've had the Fox 42 on display for a couple of shows now. Um, but now the Fox 42 is in pre-production beta testing. So there are actually uh, versions of it out in the wild being tested uh, by different shooters. And hopefully once that testing comes back in and they make a few tweaks to it, uh, hopefully we'll see that commercially available. Obviously, no price points or availability on it quite yet. On the optics side of things, we did get a chance to put hands on some of the new Leupold Mark Vs when we were out at Industry Day. Uh, several of the different rifles had them put on there. Now, there's no way that I can do an optics review based on just a couple of shots fired behind the various different optics. Uh, but some of the features that are on the Leupold Mark V do appear to be an evolution from the Mark IV, and they do appear to be uh, saving a little bit of complexity from some of the higher levels of the uh, Leupold optics. Uh, they appeared pretty clear, but then again, we were shooting out into the desert, so we had a lot of light pouring back through those lenses, um, but they were fully usable. I was hitting targets with them. Uh, it will just be interesting to see uh, once those optics are filtering out, uh, once we get some in and play with them, uh, what we feel about the new Leupold optics. We haven't done a lot with uh, Leupold for a while uh, because I felt they've really lost their way with uh, precision rifle shooters. They tended to sit on their laurels uh, with the military military and the law enforcement side and didn't offer a lot for the uh, precision oriented shooter uh, at the price points that we're looking at. So hopefully that's a change with the Mark V and hopefully we'll get to do a little bit more with those. Now, the talk of the town was actually a new optics company called Zero Compromise. Uh, and this is uh, comprised of some people from other optics companies getting together and uh, coming up with a new U.S. made optic. Now, the components are made in Austria. Uh, apparently, they're going to be assembled in Idaho. Uh, and these are top end rifle scopes. So when they say zero compromise, uh, that's not just the company name. That's actually what they're looking at in their engineering um, ideology. Uh, so what they told me when we were speaking about the different optics and the different choices 
that they made is when they came to a path on the road and they said, well, we can do this, but it's going to cost more, or we can do this and save a little bit of money, but it's going to either be less durable or it's not going to feel as nice. Uh, well, they went with the one that might cost a little bit more, but provide you with a higher quality overall optic. Uh, and that is reflected in the MSRP. Uh, so you're looking at $3,200 to $3,400 on the scopes, and they do have two models that will be coming out. And that is a 5 to 27 power by 56 millimeter objective and a 4 to 20 power with 50 millimeter objective. Now, again, these scopes are really designed for precision rifle competition shooters. Uh, so they have all the features out there that you would really want to see in those uh, locking turrets. Uh, they had a ton of travel uh, per revolution of the optic. I believe it was 15 mils of travel per revolution. Uh, just a ton of great features. Uh, the one thing that everybody kept kind of screaming about is it does jump up to a 36 millimeter main tube and Zero Compromise did that to be able to get larger optics uh, into that erector assembly and also to be able to still have room uh, to put a ton of vertical travel in that scope. Uh, so they did go to the larger main tube and this apparently has caused a lot of heartache already all across the internet. Imagine that. Um, but the reality is, when you're looking at this price point, it's not a big deal. Uh, Spur, American Rifle Company, uh, and a bunch of other ones out there are already making 36 millimeter mounts for various other optics that are on the market. Uh, so you can go ahead and order up a mount as soon as these scopes are available and uh, be able to drop them on your rifle. There's no waiting for rings to be available or waiting for them to come out with a proprietary ring set. Uh, they are already on the market and um, obviously uh, being able to just order up a spur mount and throw it on your rifle right away is a great benefit. Um, the reticle, uh, right now it is a uh, mill reticle and mill turrets. Uh, we did not ask them if an MOA version is going to be available soon. I would assume uh, that later in the year there will probably be an MOA version available, uh, but right now it's just mill. And the reticle that they have, they call it the MPCT2, which stands for Mill Precision Competition and Tactical. Um, and it is a Christmas tree style reticle. Uh, it is a very well laid out reticle. Uh, very, it is very similar uh, to the Skimmer 2 reticle that you find um, in uh, some other optics out there right now. Um, but uh, it, overall, it looked great. It didn't look cluttered when we were looking through it. And the light transmission through this optic is very, very nice. Bear in mind that when I'm looking at the scope, the first time I've ever laid hands on it and touched it is in a really dimly lit um, exposition hall. And when I say dimly lit, I mean really dimly lit. You'll see some of the videos that will be released later in the week and uh, some of the B-roll from the actual uh, show and see how horrible the lighting was in this upper hallway. Um, and I had no problems uh, looking through the optic dialed on maximum magnification and seeing what I needed to see. Uh, the illumination works very well. It's already set up with uh, night vision illumination as well. Uh, and they have a bunch of really cool options that are in the illumination mo module that are able to be tailored uh, by the end user. Uh, so overall, they have hit all the marks, even down to my pet peeve, which is the fast focus eyepiece. Uh, on these optics, uh, they have a lockable fast focus eyepiece. So you can unlock it, you can get your eyepiece set, and then lock it down. Uh, so really awesome. Uh, they will have them available in June. Uh, you're looking at about 37 ounces for that 5 to 27 power. So not a super lightweight scope, but not overly heavy. Uh, it is a really elegant looking design. It feels really nice. Uh, even the knurling on the turrets uh, is designed to be really easy to grip and really easy to turn. Uh, so I will be very anxious to see what the production models of the scope look like. That was really it for the optics side of things. Uh, we didn't spend a ton of time uh, going around and running down optics because we really didn't hear about anything uh, brand new or off the charts other than uh, zero compromise. Um, we did swing by Spur just to uh, thank them uh, for their continued support. Um, those guys are awesome. They end up sending us mounts out when we need mounts for stuff, and uh, they're quality overall is just absolutely excellent. And that's why I threw them in when I mentioned the Zero Compromise. Uh, you really have a hard time doing better than a spur mount. Uh, they are just top of the line. 
Now, some of the uh, general stuff that we came across, uh, first of all, when we showed up out there at uh, Industry Day, the first thing, as soon as we walked through the gate, was the Glock booth in front of us. Uh, so, of course, it was right there. I had to go ahead and cruise in and shoot the new Glock 19X. And everybody has been asking me, you know, how to feel, how it work. And here's the uh, bottom line. It's a Glock. Shoots like a Glock. I picked it up, ran a magazine through it. It felt like my Glock 17 Gen 5. Uh, really, there, there was nothing that jumped out at me that is spectacular or changed or whatever. The, the trigger may have felt just a little bit different on it, but uh, really... I'm not sure exactly where that 19X will fit uh, in the Glock ecosystem and who it will really appeal to. I realize it's as close to the, the military contract submission uh, that Glock is likely to release for the U.S. market, um, but that just really doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Uh, now, the one place that I can see this short slide and long grip might come in is if you were going to build a compensated pistol uh, based on this setup, uh, then now you can throw a compensator on there and you don't have the super overall length, but you do have the extended grip uh, to hold those 17 round magazines and you do you don't have to mess with spacers or mess with your magazine sticking out below your grip. Uh, so that is one aspect where I could see uh, this fit in. I don't like the fact that they uh, went back and changed it up now. So the new Gen 5 17 magazines will not work with the 19X uh, because of the way they uh, contoured the grip. Uh, you no longer have the front opening that is designed to be utilized with the Gen 5 17 mags. Uh, but I think they did that with the complaints of current users in mind. I've heard a lot of guys complain about that opening, pinching their fingers, uh, but we also don't have the magwell that we have with the Gen 5 17. And I really like the factory magwell now uh, to the point where I really don't see any reason to put a large magwell on uh, my 17 unless you are running full competition. Uh, I ran a Dawson Precision Ice Magwell on my Gen 5 uh, just for a little bit. I ended up taking it off because uh, it's not legal for some of the competitions I run and it just I didn't see a drastic reload difference uh, between the Dawson Ice and running the factory flare grip. So I'm not real sure where the 19X drops in there. Uh, now if you do want a brown clock straight from the manufacturer and the finish is great on it. Um, this is an option. The lanyard loop, again, I don't know why they went with the lanyard loop that went in the uh, grip recess instead of just hooking through the hole in the back of the grip, but it does have a lanyard loop on it that is removable. Uh, so when you go to slam those magazines in, uh, that protruding lanyard attachment point does not get in your way. Uh, we've already seen guys out there buying the Glock 19X and cutting the bottom off of it. Uh, Okay, if you really, really don't like that uh, groove in the front of the grip, I guess that's an option. But again, the point of this is uh, the 19X just really didn't hugely excite me. You probably will not see me picking one up. Um, I think my, my current range of Glock 19s and Glock 17s will work just fine uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, phone scope was uh, on scene at industry day at the range and we took a look at some of their products uh, they were actually giving away a spotting scope adapter so uh, just by attending and showing up at their booths we got a spotting scope adapter so that i can hook my iphone 7 plus uh, up to the back of a spotter uh, we'll see how that works later on but the thing that i was really excited about uh, is their new rifle scope adapter and this uses a beam splitter type setup to where you can mount the phone on the side of the eye optic and you are still looking straight through the optic you're not looking at the display of the phone and this allows for a shorter length of pull you don't have to put a spacer block in or really crank your stock out or mount your scope ahead uh, like some of the other solutions on the market require and it is somewhat universal so uh, you can set it up for quite a few different rifle scopes uh, now there are a ton of different aspects or a ton of different places where I see this as a really great option. Uh, first of all, for what I do, uh, this will allow us to get more through the scope shots for things that we're doing. It might even allow me to run this on the scope uh, during a competition so I could come back and play you footage of me actually shooting through a stage, which would be great for you guys and great for me, I think. 
One of the other places that I really see this as an advantage uh, is for younger shooters or for shooter training. Uh, now you can put a display on the side of your scope uh, that will allow you to see exactly what the shooter is seeing through the scope. Uh, so instead of trying to talk them onto targets and explain to them um, what it is that you want them to do with the reticle in relation to the target, uh, you can move the rifle until it's placed where it needs to be while they're looking through it and say, hey, here you go. This is what I want you to see. Um, also, for those of you guys that have younger hunters that you're teaching, uh, it has the ability to demonstrate to them a whole lot easier exactly where shot placement is to make an ethical kill. Uh, so I think it's got a lot of places that uh, really will fit in uh, really well. And if I remember right, they were talking about $150 price point for this. Uh, and it is U.S. made. So really, they are jumping through some hoops to get this price point down and to have it made in the U.S. Uh, so we did talk to them and uh, they should be able to get us an evaluation model as soon as they are actually available. Uh, so I am really looking forward to this and this is probably one of the most exciting things that I saw actually out at Industry Day. We managed to get by Desert Tech and checked out the 5.56 version of the MDR and the 5.56 version was really what I was waiting for when the MDR was introduced. Uh, we've shot various different versions of the 308 MDR as it was going through uh, its pre-production stages, and it always left me kind of wanting more because I really don't see the MDR as a precision rifle. Uh, not a lot of guys are doing room clearing and entry with 308s. Uh, just that compact package really screams for 5.56. And now they have the 5.56 versions out in the public hands. We're able to shoot them. And this really changes the rifle for me. It makes it fun to shoot. Um, we didn't have any problems with it. I didn't see any reliability problems while they were shooting on the range up there. Uh, we did see some malfunctions with the 308 versions. Every time I got a chance to shoot the 308, we saw some kind of malfunction. Either it was attributed to ammo or attributed to the rifle, whatever. Uh, the 556 seemed to be burning through just fine. And they also had the uh, new suppressor capable forend. So this is a larger forend uh, so that you can run a suppressor back into the forend or they had them uh, on display display with a flash can type device, uh, a Noveski Pig type uh, flash suppressor, and it really gave it a great overall look. The, the weapon balanced very well, and it was just uh, really fun to shoot. So I am happy to see that the 5.56 are going to be uh, shipping very soon. Uh, we also got a chance to go over to Tavor, and, uh, or I'm sorry, IWI, and shoot the new Tavor shotgun. Uh, this before the show, I didn't have any great interest to uh, go hunt this down. And then as we were walking by, I was taking a look at it. And this is a compact bullpup 16-shot uh, shotgun. So it's 15 in the magazines plus one. Uh, and that is just pretty amazing to me. Um, the system, how it works, it's semi-automatic. It has a three-lobe magazine, so you have five cartridges or five shells in each lobe of the magazine. Uh, and that serves as your foregrip as well. Uh, so when you bring the shotgun up, you fire your shots. And once one magazine is depleted, the bolt will lock to the rear. And then there's a release inside the trigger guard that you press and you rotate the lobe of the magazine until the next magazine lines up. It will automatically lock load that next cartridge, and then you can continue to fire. When that magazine is depleted, again, you roll it to the next one and begin firing. Uh, to chamber or to load the magazines, it's very simple. There's a loading port. You just run your shells in like you normally would on a semi-automatic shotgun. When the magazine is full, you click the release, roll it to the next one, load, roll to the next one, load. So overall, it was very simple to operate. It looked like a great overall system. There is a gas adjustment switch for uh, high brass or low brass shells. And while we were shooting birdshot, um, I really, really want to get this guy out and shoot it with some uh, some heavy double-out buck loads and see how well it will work as a defensive shotgun. Because with its compact size, um, if you're one of those guys that really want to go with a shotgun for home defense, uh, this may be a great option. Now, obviously, once you get 15 shells of double-out buck in that forend, that's going to add some weight 
to the, the gun. But overall, uh, I think that's going to aid with your recoil absorption. And because this is a semi-automatic shotgun, it was a whole lot more enjoyable to shoot uh, than something like the uh, KSG. Uh, the KSG... It's got some recoil, even when you're using uh, lower power loads, and there is the, the manual uh, magazine switchover and all this other stuff. Uh, the, the Tavor, I think, is just a much more refined setup, and coming from IWI, this is probably going to be one of those guns you can bang around pretty significantly and still have it function. Uh, so I can't wait to see those become commercially available. I don't know if I'll purchase one of those to review or just purchase one to uh, throw in the safe, uh, but it is a really cool design and a really fun gun to shoot overall. Uh, next, we'll talk about Lyman. Uh, the Lyman booth had some uh, brand new reloading products uh, on the shelf. Uh, they had three different types of presses. They have an open single stage press that's really designed to meet those uh, low cost entry level reloaders needs. Uh, they had an O type single stage press that's set up to be able to load uh, larger cartridges like 300 Win Mag. Uh, and then they had an eight position turret press on display. And the eight position turret press is really interesting because uh, it would allow me to set up dies for pretty much all of my normally reloaded cartridges and leave them in that one turret set up ready to go so if I walk in to decide I'm gonna load three five or a six five Creedmoor today I can just roll it until I have 6.5 Creedmoor resizing or 6.5 Creedmoor seating die uh, indexed if I decide I want to switch over and load to 308 I can just dial that uh, turret uh, to either the uh, full length sizing or the neck sizing or the seating die for uh, 308 and it just really will uh, reduce the amount of time set up. Now currently uh, those of you guys that have watched our reloading setups know I use the single stage Lee that you can see in the image behind me um, and we have that set up with a Hornady breech lock set up so I can just quickly uh, roll my dies in and out uh, but that does require that I have to put a different die adapter on each one of the dies that I use. Uh, so something like the turret press, I can load all the dies that I need in there and I can buy additional turrets so I can swap those turrets out. Uh, now, will it load as concentric ammo as a big heavy cast O-type press? Uh, that's something we'll have to see and hopefully uh, we'll be able to get a little bit more hands-on with those later on. Uh, they also have some new die sets that are designed specifically for modern sporting rifles. Uh, they also had a modular powder funnel, which looked really cool. It's a uh, cast aluminum anti-static funnel, and it has uh, additional adapters that are held into the bottom with O-rings for the different cartridges that you reload. So that will allow the funnel to sit more securely on the cartridges as you dump your powder in. And finally, uh, one of the things that really uh, caught my eye is we recently did a review of the Lyman Borescope. Well, Lyman is offering an update of that for the 2018 year, and they have increased the resolution of the camera and of the display. Now, unfortunately, it still does not record video, uh, so for our purposes, we're going to have to video the video screen when we utilize it, um, but the resolution of the photos has been bumped up. We didn't have information on exactly what the resolution of the photos that it takes will be, uh, but it is an advancement to that system, and we are looking forward to that because uh, just getting a better more clear image of what's going on inside your bore uh, can definitely help in some situations to diagnose uh, different malfunctions or to uh, evaluate your cleaning routine. Uh, one of the other really interesting uh, non-shooting products that we saw uh, was a new gun lock from a company called Zor. Uh, now this Gun locks have always been uh, something of an irritation to me in the past. I've preferred to go to quick access gun safes uh, because that allows me to leave a weapon loaded and ready in the safe. And once I pop the safe open, I can retrieve that firearm and it's ready to go. Uh, most of the gun locks on the market, be it trigger locks or cable locks or whatever else, uh, the manufacturers caution you to make sure that the firearm is totally unloaded. Well, the Zor gun lock is a little bit different in the fact that it blocks the chamber uh, but it does not block the magazine well and Zor actually recommends that once you lock the firearm with the Zor gun lock that you go ahead and insert a loaded magazine into the weapon. The reason for this is the Zor gun lock is designed 
to be able to utilize a user preset code uh, on the dial on the side of the weapon to quickly unlock it. Once you get the unlock confirmation on the gun lock, you just simply charge your handgun and it will eject the gun lock and chamber a live cartridge and now you're ready. Uh, so those of you that are either required by law to maintain a gun lock on your firearm or you have small children but you still want to keep a nightstand gun ready to go, uh, this may be a viable option for you. Uh, we played with it a few times in their booth. It seems to work as described and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get one later in on and uh, actually play with it here to see how easy it is to set the code and actually deal with it. Uh, and you do have a variety of options to either really simple codes uh, just to be able to maintain security from children uh, to really complex codes to limit the uh, access of that firearm uh, by adults. Uh, so overall, really interesting design, really novel approach that the uh, lock actually secures in the chamber. Uh, and the way they designed it, they say the more pressure you apply to try to open that slide while the system is locked, uh, it's a collet design, so the more pressure that uh, gun lock will exert on the inside of the chamber. Uh, so again, really interesting product. Overall, really cool. And they say even if you cut the external portion of uh, the gun lock off, uh, it will remain secured inside the chamber. So uh, during a theft attempt, uh, they're probably going to destroy the weapon uh, before they are actually able to get it into use. And I know some people may cringe at that for me. Uh, if someone somehow manages to steal one of my weapons, I would much rather see the weapon destroyed versus being able to be uh, used to commit a crime or used against a police officer or another innocent citizen. Uh, so that's kind of interesting overall. Again, um, I'll have to uh, hold the full review until we can actually get some hands-on, but really interesting product, uh, really something that interests me from a law enforcement background because I do deal with a lot of people that are not really gun people, uh, but need to be able to secure a weapon and they maybe don't have the um, ability to use a larger gun safe or etc. And lastly, we will come to the big product of the show, or at least uh, the one that gained the majority of the press, and that is the Franklin Armory Reformation Firearm. Uh, I say firearm in quotes uh, because this, at first, when they sent the press release out, appeared to be a short barrel rifle. Uh, it had a pistol grip, it fired uh, standard ammunition, had a buttstock on it, it had a 10 and a half inch barrel on it. Uh, so when you looked at the picture, that looked like a short barrel rifle. Uh, but the press release said the ATF has agreed with them. It does not require any kind of registration, so it does not require you to registered as a short barrel rifle under the National Firearms Act, and they have the ATF letter from the tech branch saying that it is not a short barrel rifle. Uh, of course, everybody started scratching their heads. You saw, if you watched our social media, I posted some blurbs on it, and my guess was going to be that it was a smooth bore. Um, close, but close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Uh, didn't count in this aspect. And when I actually got to talk to Franklin Armory, uh, they explained to us that it is not a smooth bore because actually in a strict reading of the NFA, a smooth bore would have made it a shotgun regardless of what kind of ammunition it fired. And if it was classified as a shotgun with 11 and a half inch barrel, it would have had to have a registration as a short barrel shotgun. So this is not a shotgun. Uh, it is not a smooth bore. So what is it? Well, if you actually read the definition of rifling, rifling has to impart a twist on the bullet. Uh, to impart a twist, we usually use helical rifling, which coils through the barrel. Uh, well, Franklin Armory decided, okay, well, instead of imparting a twist, let's just do straight lands and grooves. And so, yes, there are lands and grooves that run straight down the barrel. Now, obviously, this is not a Franklin Armory reformation. This is our AR pistol that we built up on a RSS defense upper and lower receiver. This has a 10 and a half inch rifled barrel. It actually has a fax and firearms barrel on it. Um, and this rifle, or I'm sorry, this pistol has had quite a few rounds downrange. And this pistol is just as accurate as a 10 and a half inch SPR. So, if we are running straight lands and grooves, how accurate is it going to be? Uh, well, current modern rifle 
ammunition requires a twist because the center gravity of the bullet uh, is to the rear of the center of pressure in the cartridge. And uh, without getting into a ton of different uh, um, ballistics behind that, uh, what will happen is when you don't spin a cartridge or a bullet that has a center of gravity behind the center of pressure, it swaps ends. Uh, so with the reformation, the bullet begins to tumble as soon as it has left the, the bore. So now you have a tumbling uh, cartridge, and they stated that they were able to hit a 4 to 5 inch target at 50 yards fairly reliably, uh, but a pistol like this will put most of its bullets through one hole at 50 yards. Uh, so... I really don't understand, other than to uh, demonstrate yet another hole in our current firearm laws, uh, why someone would go after a Franklin Armory Reformation. Uh, now, I'm all about thinking outside the box. I'm all about new options. Uh, so, in one aspect, I'm kind of glad that they did this, uh, but from the practical standpoint, I see absolutely no purpose whatsoever in uh, why someone would buy one. I couldn't go out and recommend that any of you, our buyers, pick up one of these. Uh, they are currently shopping for an ammunition manufacturer uh, to be able to produce the ammunition that they have specifically designed for the rifle to solve this tumbling problem. And we did get a chance to take a look at the projectiles for this, and uh, they do look like copper-plated Nerf footballs. I mean, there is no question. As soon as I looked at it, I understood what all the memes uh, were going out there. And we'll put a little picture of it, and you can't tell me that this does not look like a copper-plated Nerf football. I actually wish I could have taken one or two home, uh, because maybe I'll make that my new hog's tooth. I mean, it absolutely is absolutely hilarious looking at these things. And the fact that um, they are actually looking for an ammunition producer to make these. I, I can't even imagine how much they're going to be uh, per cartridge. Uh, so we'll see as that goes forward. I mean, it's something that I am really going to be interested in sitting back and seeing how it goes. Uh, but if you are looking for a compact um, option, I, I see absolutely no reason with the current ATF opinions, uh, why you wouldn't go with a pistol like this that will accurately shoot 5.56 ammunition uh, to a fairly extended range uh, with a decent amount of energy uh, over something like that reformation. To me, the benefit of getting a standard buttstock instead of something like the shockway blade that we have here or the uh, umpteen jillion different uh, pistol braces I, I just don't understand it overall, especially since the price point on the Reformation is over $2,000 uh, for the complete firearm. Uh, they will also be selling upper receivers for it individually at a lower price point. But again, uh, remember that you can't just take your 16-inch uh, AR, pop off the top, and put on a Reformation uh firearm upper receiver uh, because then you would be converting a previous firearm. So really, if you're going to go with that kind of firearm, I say just go ahead and buy the complete setup from Franklin Armory. It does come with their binary firing system in it, uh, and it's ready to go. In addition, uh, then you have an extra layer of protection should the ATF come back and decide some way to fix their opinion on this. Uh, but again, my opinion is uh, just buy or build an AR pistol, and I think you will have a much more effective uh, firearm overall. Uh, that is about it for our current uh, SHOT Show overview. Now, throughout this next week, we will be posting individual videos that we shot at each one of the booths as we went along. Uh, if you guys have any questions or comments over anything that we've covered, please go ahead and leave them in the comments section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, if you're listening to us on your favorite podcast, uh, you can send questions to us at 8541tactical at gmail.com. I want to thank uh, Magneto Speed for sponsoring our trip out to SHOT Show this year. 
Um, they were a lot of help in uh, getting things out there and getting things done. And I also want to send a huge shout out to my wife, Sarah. Uh, she had some things going on, so she wasn't actually able to be here on the video, uh, but she did stick with me through the entire drive out there and the entire week at the show and the drive back, and she managed not to kill me uh, through the entire time. Uh, she was also behind the camera for all the videos that you guys will see from the show. Uh, so again, couldn't do it without her. So you guys, make sure you throw her a thanks uh, down in the comments down below. Um, that's it for this video. If you liked it, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, get out and shoot!